David, there's a lot of talk these days about donor advised funds. We see a lot of presentations around them. We see a lot of articles, all good stuff. Let's talk about what's most important, what our viewers really need to know about donor advised funds. So the increase in donor advised funds uh, was really led by the tax act that was passed a year ago, a couple of years ago actually, um, in that they raised the standard deduction and a lot of people are finding that they cannot take their charitable deduction because it doesn't reach the threshold of the standard deduction for uh, this year's 24,400 or 12,200, I, mm -hmm. I believe. Good math. Uh, it is indexed to inflation, so that will go up every year. Uh, so what's happening are people are being encouraged by their financial advisors uh, and their tax advisors to do what's called bundling. And bundling means if you typically gave, say, $1,000 a year over the next five years, you would try and give $5,000 this year and then not give for a few years. And then therefore, if you're lucky, it would get you, not lucky, but if you did your planning right, it would get you over that standard deduction. You could take the deduction. That leads to some kind of interesting issues, though, for charities uh, that we work with. And I've heard, well, it's important to us to actually have that donor donate each year so that we can count them each year. Why? Well, there's a lot of charities when they do the reporting, reporting out to entities. For example, if you're a college or university, U.S. News Reports does a report ranking colleges and universities. And one of the categories for a university and a college is what percentage of your annual fund is donated by alumni each year? What percentage of alumni donate to your annual fund? Uh, the higher that is, the higher your ranking goes a little bit is the concept. Uh, so if they're donating in one year, can you then report out that they've donated the next four years even though they gave it? The answer is no if you're doing it honestly. So it's important to have that happen. So a lot of charities are kind of at a crossroads. What do we do? We want those donations each year. We want them to keep donating to us. And my suggestion is as opposed to fighting donor advice fund, sure, we'd like the money to come directly to us, but instead of fighting it, is to embrace it and market to it. And the concept is this. Your donor wants to make that you know, $2,500, $5,000, $1,000 a year donation. So why don't you bundle it, open up a donor advice fund, say put $10,000 in, assuming that's the minimum that you're allowed to put in, in year one. They'll get their tax deduction year one. They'll be able to uh, take it out of their taxes. They'll be able to use the charitable deduction. They'll hit the threshold, more likely than not. Um, and then what they can do is make a recommendation to the donor advice fund each year to basically take out of the donor advice fund whatever the amount they normally would take out. And that gets you around the hurdle of a donor saying, I'm only going to do a major do uh, donation once every five years and, and losing that uh, deduction. Plus, donors are looking for ways to basically take advantage of that charitable deduction you know, under, uh, under a tax law now that kind of makes it harder to do. Mm. Good stuff. Now, as it relates to planned giving, so those are typically treated as outright gifts or pledges, right? For planned giving, we know that there's a wonderful opportunity with these donor advised funds, and that is? Well, there's a couple mm -hmm. in, in the planned giving, and I just wanted to back up because you say that, uh, you know, we work, know it works as a pledge. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes, good question, right? so that the, the real question is, if somebody wants to pledge to you, uh, five-year payments of $5,000 a year, and then they, so they make an individual pledge, and they come to you and say, oh, oh, by the way, I'm using my donor advice fund, or what they're saying is I have a donor advice fund, and I'll pledge over five years that I'm going to do that. The question always is, how do you book that? Mm. And what do you do? Um, and up to about a year ago, the fiction was you would put the money into the donor advice fund, you have to write an agreement that basically says, I agree that I will recommend to the donor advice fund that payments will come out each year. And if the donor advice fund would send you a letter saying, yes, we accept that recommendation, then the charity could book it as a pledge, but from the donor advice fund. Uh, because the IRS has this kind of uh, concept that when you make a gift in order for you to get the charitable deduction, you have to give up control. So, one of the issues there is if I'm making the personal pledge and then saying, but my donor advice fund, I'll have them pay it, my personal pledge. Have you given up control, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and up to this point, the answer has been no. There has been a letter, uh, actually a proposed regulation that hasn't been adopted, but the, the, in the proposed regulation says you can uh, basically rely on it. 
that says, we understand the fiction, we understand that people are putting money into the donor advised fund, um, and that is really them making the recommendation. So you can now kind of make a pledge of your personal, you know, make a personal pledge and have your donor advised fund fulfill that. It's tricky because it's only basically a proposed regulation uh, as opposed to an actual adopted one. You know, the better the better course is to uh, still have them uh, get the donor advice fund to say, yes, we will do a multi, it's called a multi-year uh, recommendation. And they're all set up to do that. You know, They're in control all, of the funds at that point. At that point, the right. donor advice fund is in control yeah. of the funds. Yeah. Yes. Um, so going back to the plan giving aspect of it. A donor advised fund has an advisor, so it's typically the donor, donor, his spouse, her spouse, uh, that makes the recommendations. What happens when they pass away? Who's making the recommendations? Well, most donor advised funds are set up so that uh, you can have succeeding generations or, or appoint people that can make those recommendations. So a lot of families will do, you know, it's my, uh, my wife and I, or my husband and I, and now my children, and maybe my grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, that lineage is going to stop. Um, and what happens if there's funds left over that have not been given out? And that's where there's a plan giving aspect to it. You can and should be basically marketing and asking your individual with donor advice funds to consider putting your charity in as the beneficiary, the ultimate beneficiary, or at least one of the ultimate charitable beneficiaries. Um, and that way, if it's, let's say, the husband and wife and then their children and finally the children pass away and there's still money in the fund, then that designation would pay that money to the charity. And that would be the end of the fund. Finally, you sound anxious like you want a typical plan giving guy. You can't wait for people to pass. Oh, that's a deadly question. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm not going to touch that. I am noticing, working with clients, that trust, charitable trust, don't seem to be coming in, the new trust don't seem to be generated like they were with the World World II generations. I see a lot of uh, clients who have, are beneficiaries of charitable trust going back decades, but I don't see a lot of new ones coming in. I'm wondering if that's a trend with, for the baby boomers and whether, I mean, we know that donor advised funds are certainly easier to set up, uh, whether there's a correlation between the two. So I, I think what you're really asking is you don't see a lot of foundations uh, being set up, which are actually trust, mm -hmm. as opposed to the cruts and crats and mm -hmm. you know, charitable gift annuities and such like that pay you income back. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the question really is, are the donor advice funds replacing those old trust foundations? Yeah. Uh, and the answer is yes. And the answer is yes for a, a number of reasons. Uh, first, you know, you set up a foundation, you set up a trust, you need an attorney. It costs money to do that, uh, to set it up right, because you don't want to run the risk that the documentation is wrong and you've done something improper uh, and the IRS comes in and disallows basically the child deduction and blows the whole thing up and, you know, all the penalties, the fees, the uh, excise taxes that are involved with that. Uh, so it's expensive to set up. Um, and then annually, you have to have basically a trustee meeting uh, in, you know, in theory, you're supposed to do that. Uh, there's a requirement that you uh, uh, at least distribute 5% of, uh, you know, the, the value of that trust each year as a minimum, um, which should not be a problem because the whole idea is to set it up for child distributions. Uh, and then at the end of the year, the trust has to file a tax return, uh, or at least an informational tax return, and that requires you to hire an accountant and uh, have that done properly. So there's certain expenses that are uh, incurred when you set up the trust, and then there's ongoing expenses each year. With the donor advice fund, that's all taken care of by the administrator of the donor advice fund, uh, be it the commercial administrators like the Vanguards, the Fidelities, the Schwabs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or the, what I'll call the non-commercials, the community foundations. They all do that. So you basically, all you're doing is transferring the funds in. They set up a very easy portal, most of them, that you can go online, make your recommendations, the funds come out. Any tax reporting that has to be done is done by the administrator, uh, and that's it. So from your standpoint, it's kind of easy peasy, mm. uh, to borrow a phrase from a Southern gentleman in Texas at this point. Mm. Um, so the trend is now going into donor advice funds more so than the uh, foundation or the foundation trust. You're seeing that more and more and more. Um, you know, the other thing is there's no requirements under the uh, donor advice fund to actually have the money go out. Uh, Congress has been toying with the idea of making the same requirement, the 5% rule or some kind of termination date where the money goes out. But as of now, you can put money in there and it could sit there for generations if you'd like. 
I'm not sure why you would do that other than, uh, you know, wanting that tax deduction and not really caring about the rest of it. So good. Good stuff. So top takeaways for our audience are keep an eye out, have your finance department or anybody that's accepting, receiving the checks, tell you when they get a check from a donor, donor advice fund. Correct. Right. And then call them and have the conversation like we would with any donor and see if uh, they're open to uh, considering our charity as a beneficiary of the fund. Right. We should be aware enough if a donor is concerned about having enough deductions for the year to at least at a high level, depending on your skill set, right? About bundling option yes. for advice funds. Anything else? Uh, and just having that discussion that if they have a donor advice fund to please consider making that recommendation that year for your charity. Good idea. You are smart. Should have thought about that. <laughs> so if you all need help building a sustainable plan giving program, please consider us. We're fun to work with. We've been doing it for a long time for hundreds of charities. You can reach us on our website, giftplanningdevelopment.com. You can email us, info at giftplanningdevelopment.com. You can call us, 610-653-7906. Am I missing any? Uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Joe and David. So, uh, David, you're David. I'm, I'm Joe. Are you sure? I'm not Joe. You're David. I'm positive. Good. <laughs>